Hello, it is Joe. <sighs> it's so good to speak with all of you. It's so good to have a group, my small group, as they say in uh, religious communities, to speak to as long as I want, whatever I want, and to get feedback and to interact. I find it truly a pleasure. It's one of the many rewards of putting this show out there to you guys on a regular basis of reaching out on a regular basis of you know providing something for people giving people a glimpse into my world having the courage to do that you know it gives me a uh, <sighs> such a pleasure to know that you're out there listening I know I say that a lot, but I really mean it. Um, the views and subscribes that I get on YouTube, the uh, hits that I get on the blog, it really means a lot to me. Every single one. It doesn't need to be a lot of people. It may <laughs> become a lot of people. Uh, this may go in that direction, but it really means a lot that one individual has taken the time to listen I hope that what I say and uh, what I share you know gives you a better day gives you an insight to create your own <sighs> sharings offerings whether they're in this format or another whether it's art or photography or writing or loving or heck caring for children whatever you do however you share um, I hope that my sharing inspires yours just as uh, other people inspire me I uh, I have two things to share with you today but before I get to them I want to share a brief story about a man I met in New York I don't know his name, but I was doing deliveries. I rode around on my bicycle in Manhattan and got paid to do it, which was quite a privilege. And uh, I delivered packages, mostly food, to people in uh, various parts of the city, in their homes and their workplaces. It was, it was really neat. And... Uh, it was something that was great to do. It's one of those bucket list things. Like, why not be a courier in New York City? Especially as a person who, you know, makes riding a bike such a big part of their life as I do. It's, it's a neat thing to have done. And, uh, you know, I left it for a couple of reasons, which I can talk about later. But it was nice to have done it for a short period of time and really have gotten to know that experience and the city and the people. And... The gentleman I want to talk with you about, if I remember correctly, he was somewhere, not right around Washington Square Park, but kind of in that area, you know, in kind of the south, edging a little bit towards the west. Um, I could be wrong. Everything kind of feels like the west because I was coming from Brooklyn, so <laughs> there was a lot of westward bike riding uh, to get to Manhattan. But anyway... This guy um, treated me with the utmost respect. I found him kind of in a hurry. I was trying to locate the entrance to his building. This particular building had an entrance in the basement around the back that was kind of a service entrance for all of the deliveries, etc. And... I had been treated different ways by different people, but this guy didn't have to treat me nearly as well as he did, but he just did. And it wasn't anything that he did, it was how he did it. And I felt just 
treated as a valued person, as an equal, you know, in my service job where those kind of things are up for grabs, you know. Uh, service people are expected to treat everyone else with dignity, but others are not expected to treat them with dignity. These jobs in our society are trying for many people, and some people I know, including um, Aaron Nicholson, one of my heroes on Facebook, uh, is has posted some wonderful things about uh, you know some of her loves, which include uh, you know body positivity, but also learning how to work with dignity in retail positions. And so, Erin is one of my very favorite people uh, for her courage in a variety of areas of life. And like I said, this gentleman just made me feel good. Um, he was a little older than me. Uh, maybe he had learned over time just to treat everyone incredibly well, regardless of station in life. And I commented on it. I said, wow, thank you, you know, for doing this. And he said, yeah, like it was no big deal, like it's natural. He said, this is how we treat each other. And I was like, wow, okay, so it's normal for you. That's how everybody treats everybody. That's great. And I found it was really remarkable. Um, I'm remarking upon it at the time, and I'm remarking upon it now. And uh, that dignity really uh, shone through. The first of the two things I want to talk with you about today is the uh, this wonderful conversation I had yesterday. I often get into conversations, you know, maybe once a week or once every couple weeks, deep conversations about religion, especially with Christians, because there's a lot of them in our country. And I really enjoy digging into conversation about religion, about what the individual person I'm speaking with believes, about what's important to them, about what's fascinating to them, about their beliefs, um, religious beliefs or spiritual beliefs, whatever you want to call them, uh, those are fascinating to me. What's, what's important to me is what the person likes about what they're doing, why they chose that path, why they love that path, what's interesting to them about what they've learned why they've chosen this particular avenue in life over another, you know. Um, m most of us, if, if not all of us, choose some kind of beliefs, even if it's agnosticism where we say that we can't know, or even if it's atheism where we say the whole thing is silly and we want nothing to do with it. That's still a position, it's still a belief. Um, there's so many different ones to choose from. Many of them are cultural. Many of us choose to just go with what we learned as children. Some of us will leave that and explore and come back to it. Some of us will stay with it um, without an exploratory period of other things. And all paths are valuable. Um, some of us will embrace atheism at, or agnosticism. Uh, some atheists are reacting to negative experiences they had with religion. Um, just as some people will switch religions. You know, a Jewish person might become a Messianic Jew. Um, a, uh, you know... Hindu might become a Buddhist or whatever because of wanting something different than what they were raised with. I know many people who were raised um, in our culture, which is primarily Christian, who've become Buddhists uh, because they wanted something else. Um, 
there's a lot of different emotional reasons, uh, reactions to the past that we choose what we've done, that we choose the path of, you know, religious and spiritual speculation um, that we do. These things can't be proven. Uh, if you can prove something, then, you know, only the most extreme people would argue about it, you know. I can prove the theory of gravity to you by dropping something and seeing that it falls. You know, we can look at experiments of how gravity causes, you know, things to move closer to each other. Uh, we can look at um, the subtle effects that even each of us has on each other, you know, as we move closer and further from each other, we exert more or less gravity. You know, we can see how it changes time, how the satellites in space have to adjust their time uh, to match ours because of the slight relativity uh, effects that happen even between us and the robots we put in space. Um, it's fascinating. Uh, there's a lot of really good evidence that shows that gravity exists. Do science, scientists understand it completely? No. But there's a lot of really good evidence that shows that something is going on. And that kind of approach is what I like to look at religion with. I don't want to convert people. I don't want people to convert me. If people get into that place where they try to kind of take the higher ground or the upper hand in an argument and, uh, you know, try to say that what their thing, what their belief is, is the best or the only belief and I should believe it and um, start kind of taking that condescending teacher role towards me in a conversation, I cut them off quick. I try to do so with love and care. Um, yesterday I was able to do so with a person who through our mutual maturity, um, both of us were able to uh, continue the conversation even after she crossed that boundary. You know, I don't allow people to kind of lead the conversation in this I'm going to convert you kind of way, and uh, I'm very sensitive to that. Um, and this person and I worked very well together. And we showed a remarkable willingness to just talk about this without strife. Uh, we were even joined by a third person, which was a first for me. I found that I must be on the right path. I know I'm on the right path because some of the things that I want to have happened really are starting to happen. This person not only joined our conversation because she enjoyed it so much and wanted to chip in and share, she brought a different perspective, uh, a little more openness to my flexibility and agnosticism, a little more acknowledgement of the things that can't be proven, and, uh, you know, my desire for everybody to have their own space for their own spiritual adventure. And she also shared, you know, many of the Christian beliefs of the other person I was speaking with, and it was really fascinating to be talking in a threesome instead of a twosome. It was really cool. I uh, often, like I say, speak with twos. And to speak with threes, it was, it was just such a valuable experience uh, socially. Uh, to see myself expanding, to see the, the love that I have for one-on-one -on -one conversations, and as you guys know, monologues to the video, to see that expanding into a three. It was so neat to see um, my growth and to see that the things I'm doing are attracting 
more people of similar minds. People from all faiths who just want to want to interact with other people and talk about that stuff and share it in an environment where we don't cross the line of arguing, of debating, of trying to prove one is better than the other, of trying to convince each other of this or that. Because people hold these beliefs very strongly, the likelihood you're going to convert somebody is pretty slim. If somebody wants to learn more about your religion, if somebody wants to join it, if somebody's interested in, you know, looking into it and seeing what it has for them, yeah, please help them. But understand that coercing, forcing, arguing them into anything, trying to logic people into anything, it actually lowers your chances of converting somebody. It puts a negative on people and it really, uh, it entices people to join your group for the wrong reasons, which diminishes the stability of your group. So, as tempting as it can be, let's all try to know that what's true for us is 100% true for us and be completely confident in our beliefs and never hold back to share them. But never, never believe that they're 100% true for someone else. Even within one denomination, there are many churches. And even within one church, there are many people. And even within one small group of people within a church who share similar ideas, there is such diversity of faith. It is... N I don't... I don't want to use the word never, but... I can't imagine that two people would have exactly the same beliefs, ever. I, I see such an infinite variety of us. Of us divine creatures here on Earth. Um, here on Earth, but connected to the universe. In so many ways, I'm just beginning to understand. All of us connected, ultimately as divine beings, all of us connected as one, perhaps. I really like that idea. But all of us being completely separate and valuable and unique. Um, valuable both as connections to source and as unique snowflakes. I believe that we can be both. I don't believe that we need to be one or the other. Um, I find that, that that black and white, right or wrong, one or the other kind of mindset can often cross that barrier between individual freedoms for me and individual freedoms for the other person. And I think it limits us. Um, I once heard somebody say that the difference in psychology between people with abundance and people without it is this idea that you have to have either or that people say well I can either have this or that but I can't have them both and that keeps them in poverty and that if they say I can have this and this uh, that and idea instead of either or uh, leads to wealth and allows people to enjoy abundance so that's awesome, and I'm very, very grateful for the three-person conversation I was able to have yesterday about my most deep and wonderful uh, ideas and speculations and sharing with others. Um, I had fun drawing out the person in that three group who uh, was saying the least. Uh, that person was very good at asking questions and listening. And I wanted to draw that person out to share and speak more. Um, and so I'm proud of myself for doing that. Um, oh, on another tangent uh, related, uh, another reason this conversation was so valuable is that the third person who joined us remembered me from when I had visited that coffee house six months ago. I'm in Athens. And uh, I had revisited uh, my favorite uh, Athens coffee house called Two Story. And uh, 
it's an independent, of course. I love independence, and it's near the college. I uh, have a desire to explore some other ones. There's a small, I think it's a small chain, that I want to explore. Uh, you know, you get these small local chains like Black Dog in Tallahassee. This uh, Jittery Joe, I think, is an Athens chain. It may be a larger chain than that. I don't know. But I've seen that they have multiple locations. Heck, one of them might be a roastery. I don't know. But um, I do love to check out independently owned businesses and independently owned common spaces for conversation. Uh, meeting people and discussing whatever we're excited about is just so great. It's just so neat to do that. And heck, uh, coffee houses provide a unique atmosphere for that. So um, I'm going to explore some more. But yeah, this person remembered me. It was really special. And uh, we had had a conversation that had stayed with her uh, for, heck, half a year. And when I returned to this little community of regulars and uh, people who frequent uh, this little community that revolves around uh, Two Story, well, heck, it was fascinating to, uh, to be remembered and to remember her. Uh, she reminded me of our conversation and I remembered what we had spoken about. And uh, it was fascinating to see what, see that I had an impact on somebody. It made me feel valuable. As a traveler, I don't often have the opportunity to see people on a regular basis. You know, I linger in my favorite towns for a good while so I can make friends and connections that'll last. And uh, I met this person once. I was in Athens for three days last fall. But heck, I made an impact on somebody and I actually was able to experience them in person. It was really cool. <sighs> so, the other thing I want to touch on is distortions. I was uh, purchasing a David Data book that I had read a sample of uh, yesterday or the day before. I can't remember when the last video was uh, recorded, either yesterday or the day before, but I put out a sample. Uh, excuse me, he put out a sample, I read it, and then I bought the book. Uh, there's kind of a nice funnel from checking out an author on Goodreads to reading an Amazon sample to actually getting into their book completely and uh, putting down some money to uh, honor them. <sighs> so, I was getting into that and I was just going through the purchasing process. I didn't even, you know, get that deep into the sample because what I learned while purchasing was so valuable. It was the idea of, hmm, emotional distortions of things. Um, as I wake up, as I speak with you, um, I've been enjoying waking up, checking some emails, you know, seeing what my day has in store for me staying in touch with clients, but also getting in touch with my favorite authors and uh, my favorite people on Facebook, just kind of getting in touch with the world out there. And uh, I like to do that, you know, for some inspiration before I speak with you guys. And like I said, sometimes just the process of waking up brings me a negative thought, you know, um, negative stuff from the past. And in small doses, negativity is really healthy because we can use it for wisdom. Wallowing in it gets really bad really fast. It's like taking a powerful medicine. A small amount of it can help you and a lot of it will hurt you, put you in a really confusing and uh, negative place that it can be really hard to dig out of. That too can be positive. Those strong negatives can be positive. Over time, we can choose to make them that way, but uh, 
in the moment they can feel pretty overwhelming and, and uh, negative. I know that negative and positive is just a false duality, just a mental construct that we put on life. And I know that all negatives and positives can flow from one to the other, that they can change. Too much of a good thing can be a negative, right? You know, But I find that there's a wisdom in how much negative do I want now to create a positive? How much positive do I want to not create a negative? You know, it's just things that we like and things that we don't like, right? It's nothing strong like good and evil. It's just preferences and things we'd rather not experience, right? It's choice. So I draw a distinction, I guess, between choice and judgment, where choice is, I'd like to have this instead of that. It's looking at the smorgasbord of life and saying, I really want the fruit salad, not the fried chicken. You know, that's choice. Uh, we can judge things negative and positive. We can say, hmm, I foresee better results digestively from this fruit salad than the uh, fried chicken or whatever. You know, we can get all these different things we choose what we want and I at least try to stay away from judgment of trying to say that this thing the fried chicken is always bad I don't eat meat very often but when I'm overwhelmed and my willpower is low I find indulging that craving helps me I've had meat twice this month that's amazing. I haven't eaten barely, I can think even a scrap of meat in a long time. I think I had meat broth back in February, maybe. Maybe it was January. It's very rare for me to eat meat. I don't have this kind of 100% I never, ever, ever eat it um, idea. I used to. I used to just quit everything completely 100% cold turkey. And uh, that was a healthy phase for me because I needed to assert control over my actions and my cravings and to work with my cravings the only way I knew how, which was 100%. It's easier to do things or not do things. To do things only a very little in extreme moderation, to follow some guideline, dietary or otherwise, 99% of the time is harder. To never do something is easier. Um, there's a part of our minds that just says, it brings in judgment. We say, this is bad for me. I'm never going to do it. It's not okay. I'll never, ever, ever do this. And, you know, that's true. I think that that type of black and white thinking is good for you know, cliffs. I believe that jumping off a cliff is 100% bad for me, you know, or playing in traffic, or taking dangerous drugs, or, um, you know, other addictive substances. I think that those are 100% no's for me. Um, I think only a very, very wise and strong person could approach an addictive substance or a very dangerous life and death experience and still come out well. Uh, I'm not saying that isn't the path for someone. I know someone who was uh, suicidal. Um, I met her many, many years ago and she had jumped off of a parking structure. And well, she uh, <sighs> this, this woman had had quite an experience. She had uh, jumped off this structure and uh, had been in such a bad place. And she said that she was in such a good place, that she was in bliss right after that moment. Um, she became... Uh, I think paralyzed. I, when I met her, she was in a wheelchair. I don't know if it's permanent damage or if she got better. I don't know what happened. But 
she was in a wheelchair when I met her and she said that she had jumped into a blissful experience and a blissful life. I don't recommend suicide or paralyzing yourself as a path to bliss because I've also heard accounts of people who survived suicide attempts who as soon as they jumped knew it was a mistake knew that it was the wrong thing to do uh, I don't know how to speak on something so big of gambling going all in in such a dramatic way with one's life to say I may lose my life if I survive I may see it as a big mistake that I have to learn from I may see it as a wonderful thing I may just die and not be able to have this life anymore you know that's a big choice um, I can't say what it's like for other people. I can't see what other people's lives and other pa people's paths are, and I would never judge it. Never judge anyone who did it or tried it or wanted to do it. But, you know, it's a powerful thing, and uh, I would never say what's right or wrong for other people uh, in those moments. Who knows? If I saw someone trying to do it, I'd probably try to talk about it. You know, or at least talk to them about it to make sure they've explored all the other options before making a choice like that. But, uh, I don't know, I've never been in that position of seeing someone on the edge. And uh, maybe I will, maybe I won't. I don't know what that experience is like either, but... Uh, I reckon I have an instinct to love people and to keep them alive and to keep everyone in my human tribe uh, hopeful, even myself. <laughs> even when I get uh, frustrated with life, um, I find I quickly bounce back to uh, engagement and moving forward with it. So uh, yeah. I guess my greatest advice on that would just be, remember everything's temporary. And even your darkest hours don't last that long. Uh, so, distortions. Um, I wanted to talk with you guys about those negative moments we have in life, about those distortions we have. Um, I've saved this one till the end. It took me a lot of tangents to get here. Uh, this episode has been more episodic. I've had, you know, a series of five or ten minute little uh, vignettes more than uh, tangenting around one central theme. But I do want to go in a little more on distortions of how our coping mechanisms that we develop as children and maintain throughout our lives uh, the ways that we react to uh, experiences that we don't know how to handle, uh, overwhelming experiences. You know, I feel that huh, it's just really powerful sometimes and we can't handle what's going on in the life. I, I don't want to call them negative experiences, but they're overpowering overwhelming, confusing experiences, and we adjust ourselves to cope with them in ways that become habitual. And uh, through fear, we make a habit out of flinching. And some people do this intentionally to hurt us and control us. A lot of people do it unintentionally just to, uh, just as an expression of their coping mechanisms. Um, you know, I see babies come into this life innocent. I see children learn to uh, manipulate adults and to throw barbs at each other and to become human. I don't know that how much of it is in our genes and how much of it is just learned behavior. Um, 
But that doesn't matter. We can learn to exceed our genes. Humanity has been doing that for a long time. We have been uh, more than animals in the sense that we teach our young. That being said, some animals, especially our fellow mammals, do that as well. They teach their young and nurture their young. So I don't think that we're unlike the animals. I think that we are animals. I just think that we're on a sliding scale towards something more uh, than what's programmed into us, into our instincts and uh, emotions. That being said, um, we have a lot to learn from animals because they are closer to acting freely out of instinct and less inhibited than we are. And for us to move on, uh, evolving beyond not just in our DNA, but as societies, um, we have to accept the parts of ourselves and others that are animal um, to embrace them, to accept them, to find ways of expressing our whole selves, not just the selves that are acceptable in society. We need to find ways, of course, that are safe for ourselves and for others. We don't want to express these uh, desires, instincts, in ways that hurt people, but it's really important to uh, be a full person. Acknowledge your desires and explore them in a fantasy. Explore them in uh, stories. Explore the, your desires. Um, these are often sexual desires. Uh, sex is repressed a lot in our culture. Um, you know, supposedly Freud said that uh, sex is repressed in culture so that um, men will work harder. That the idea is to motivate men uh, that women motivate men to work, you know, to support families, etc., uh, by withholding sex and creating communities that allow them to do that, so that men will, uh, you know, be motivated to do the kind of work that uh, women and families want. Um, that's an interesting idea, and I'm going to certainly do some more writing. I've started an article that I haven't finished yet on... Uh, some of the sexual politics in the, uh, or sexual economics, I should say, in the uh, article that I read on Slate the other day. I want to uh, dig into that and write an article of my own. So lots of things to explore, and I'm certainly tangenting a lot. I'm going to wrap this one up pretty soon because these videos get so big they're hard to upload, even on the best of Wi-Fi systems. <laughs> but uh, what I'm hoping to do is understand my distortions. I want to understand where I've overreacted as a defense mechanism. It wasn't an overreaction at the time, but it is now, you know? There, distortions are kind of like blind spots. It's not that you're 100% blind and you can't see something, but you see something as different than it is. You see a small thing is huge and a huge thing is small. Um, I just used the word you. I shouldn't distance myself. I see things as large that are small and small that are large. And that is a way of feeling trapped and feeling limited. And, uh, you know, for example, uh, if I were punished as a child for a small offense in an extremely large and dramatic and uh, angry negative way, uh, overwhelming way, well, I might become paranoid or I might see small things as large. Um, perhaps a person who was uh, neglected as a child and didn't get the attention they needed, needed to present large, uh, dramatic um, outbursts or act out in extreme ways in order to get a small amount of attention. Uh, they might see, you know, small things as large. 
Um, they might see large things as small. They might see their outburst as not a big deal because that's just what you need to get a small amount of attention. You know, um, seeing things as they really are can help us. I don't know that we'll ever get to complete clarity on that, but we can get closer. In every day, we can walk in wisdom and get a little closer. And this reminds me of the people I spoke with uh, in the other point I wanted to make in this video. This reminds me of that idea that, hey, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, this reminds me of that idea that, ah, oh, I'm losing it. Ah, oh, sometimes I tangent too far. Shoot. <sighs> well, it's been 40 minutes. That tangent will come back to me, I'm sure, in that form or another, in another video, but I'll leave it here. Um, for whatever reason, that thought was drawing me back to the people I spoke with yesterday, who I love and honor as uh, fellow spirits, kindred spirits, and uh, just in the same way that I honor all of you listeners as uh, soul family and uh, special uh, people who resonate with me. Um, if you want to uh, find out about the different ways I share with the world, uh, not just these videos, but also in writing and in social media, you can find out about all the stuff I do uh, at uh, joneely.net slash community. I should also spell out Neely. I've been neglecting to do that. For anyone who doesn't know, it's J-O-E-N-E-E-L-Y uh, dot net slash community. I uh, have an interesting last name that people will spell in a variety of ways. So N-E-E-L-Y, that's my name, if you want to find me online. That being said, it's on the channel name for this video, so maybe it's obvious. I don't know. Anyway, love you guys. Thanks for connecting as always. And thanks for watching this big video. I'm uh, considering perhaps chopping these up into smaller bits um, as I record so it'll be easier to upload and maybe even a little more organized into sections. Who knows? If that's not distracting for me, I may adopt it as a plan. Uh, but you could bet that I'll probably start experimenting with it. Have a wonderful day or night, wherever you are, and know that you are loved uh, by yourself, by everyone, and by the world. Uh, and we're all just learning to show it more and more all the time. Have a great day. Bye-bye.